Hey guys, it's Tanika Patoa, and today I'd like to talk about how I go about drawing the human head for animation. Whether you're doing character design, hand-drawn animation, or storyboarding, we all know that there are many different styles for animation, ranging from realism to the stylized to the cartoony. In this video, I'm going to talk about how I go about drawing the head for animation and how to adapt it to different styles. There are many ways in going about drawing the human head, and they all come from different schools of drawing, and they're all really good. One great drawing method I'd like to talk about, and the one that's most commonly used, is the Andrew Loomis method, which I encourage you guys to look up. YouTube channel Proco does some great examples of using the Loomis method to draw the human head, as well as exploring detailed head drawings afterwards using the same technique. I also learned about the Loomis method from Mark Brunette's Ultimate Anatomy video course, which I highly recommend, it's really good. There's also looking at the books written by Andrew Loomis himself. They do a much better job at explaining how to use these methods than I would, so I'm going to link you guys to them in the video description. If you want a more detailed look about the method, the only thing I'm going to do is demonstrate it for my line of work, and what I think about when I do draw the head. First, let's go through a general run through of the Loomis method. And we're going to go for something that's not specific, it's just very general, it's really just building the foundation. I would draw two center lines, horizontal and vertical. The horizontal lines being roughly where the eyebrows sit, and the vertical line being the center of the face, and where the nose and mouth sits. Then, you're going to trim the slides slightly as if you're cutting them with a blade. This will be the side of our head, and roughly where the temple sits. Now, at the bottom edge of your new cut sides, you're going to draw another horizontal line across. This is where the nose will sit. If I'm going to draw the ears, which will be much later on, the ears sit right in between where the brow line and the nose line sits. Next, we're going to indicate our chin and draw the jaw. Now remember, different designs or different human beings have different proportions, but for this case, we're just going to keep everything average. So I'm just going to grab the proportional spacing between the eyebrows and the nose and apply that same proportion of spacing from the nose to the chin. Right in between the nose and the chin, so if we're going to do an even half, we'll just indicate our mouth. Now we're going to create a jaw. It can be smooth, sharp, or blocky. That's really up to you. One thing you want to think about is the jaw in relationship with the mouth. So you could put the angle change in the jaw or the hinge of the jaw close to where the mouth is elevation wise. If we want to apply a bit of surface information, we're going to create a line from the top of the side circles towards the chin or the sides of the chin. At this point, we're defining a bit of the forehead, the brow, and possibly the cheekbones. We can add another line from the side of our head where the brow line sits or the top of our ear towards the side of the chin. This will help indicate that indent between the brow and the cheekbone. And I would say try drawing this in a 3 4 angle or even a side angle. The great thing about let's say the 3 4 angle or the side angle is now you're going to be able to see what's happening in the sides of the head. On the front view you can't really see it because it's more flat but on the 3 4 and the side views you can actually see the sides of the head that are slightly cut. Again, use your cross-section lines to help guide you in where the face is facing or the overall angle. As you can see here, I'm not really adding any specific features like eyes, nose, and lips and anything like that or hairlines. Something like this is a good start at least for a foundation. So now we have a rough foundation for the head. From here, I would recommend you to try this out in different angles. And I would also reference different types of heads. Some heads have different proportions and sizes. Try and practice this method until it becomes a bit familiar, including the cross-section lines to help guide you in terms of the angle, the dimension, and the direction it's facing. The great thing about this method is that it teaches you how to use lines as placeholders and measurements, such as trying to figure out proportions, which is important for animation consistency. I know when I storyboard or do rough drawings, I indicate shorthands for the eyes, nose, and ears sitting within these lines. Different designs, again, call for different types of shorthands. Depending on the style you're going for, these parts can change. As you can see in the demo that I'm doing right now, I'm really just indicating the eyes, the lips, and the nose, not really putting detail, but just indicating it like a mark. And when I storyboard, this is kind of close to how I draw my storyboards and the characters in them. More importantly, it gets a point across. But if I want to go back and clean up the drawings, at least I have a foundation, I've placed my marks, and have the freedom and choice to do so. So after getting used to the Loomis method of drawing the head structure or a rough foundation of it, try drawing the ears, the nose, the lips, the eyes, and the mouth. And this is where you're probably going to want to look up references of the eyes that you're going for, the nose that you're going for, or the libelicious kissy lips that you're going for. Now if we're doing a really average looking human head, 
everything would be very equal and average, meaning that the spacing and proportions from each other are very even. The size of things are pretty even too. So like I said earlier, the top and bottom of the ear would match the horizontal lines of where the brows and the nose sit. Some people have tiny ears, like myself. Some people have big ears, but for this case, we're just doing everything by the books. For this one, the width of the nose would be similar to the size of one eye. And I'm going to use the same width as the spacing between both eyes. Again, this is just an example of how I'm just using very even proportions based on what's already there. The Loomis method does talk about detailed measurements about how to go about this, like how the tear duct should fall in line vertically with each nostril, how the top of one of the cut sides of the human head can be used as a landmark for the hairline. The good thing about the Loomis method, what it's teaching is it's teaching the usage of landmarking and making proportional notes. And that's going to be pretty important for characters with very specific proportions. You should try referencing different types of heads because there's just so many different types of faces and shapes. Some would require eyes more narrow towards the nose. Some would have small ears. Some would have bigger noses. Some would have wider jaws, wider cheeks. Some would have big chins. Some would have really tiny sharp chins. And that's why the first foundation of the Loomis method is great as a tool because it's also a pretty good tool that allows you to make changes if you needed to. You could just grab random pictures of people's faces, portraits, or whatever. I like to grab different screen grabs from characters of my favorite TV show, for example. Kind of study what makes all of them so different from each other, what makes them so distinct, and how I would redraw them if I, let's say, want to do fan art of them. And what's great with all of these is that you can start with a very rough foundation of the Loomis method that's very generic, but then as you add more details or more aspects to make it more specific, you can add those along the way. However, is it applicable for animation designs where things are more stylized and exaggerated? I think it has its places, but good drawing skills and techniques should allow you to adapt different styles. Things that are closer to life would do well with the Loomis method of drawing the head, but some do require changes to make the method work, but in a different way. So I tried experimenting with this by drawing or tracing over existing characters. From what I've experimented with, Disney characters also somewhat match the Loomis method, albeit with more stylized shapes and exaggerated features. But the brow line, the nose line, the ear, they all kind of sit in place and sort of match each other. And it's relatively simple to use this method to keep proportions consistent. But it doesn't always line up to your cross-section lines, but still, drawing those cross-section lines will help me indicate, oh, actually the lines sit right in between the ear or three-fourths of the ear, for example. So it really does change depending on style and character design. Like for some character designs, the top of the ears would be a halfway point for the character's eyes. Like this Mega Man Legends example I'm drawing over. So yeah, I would recommend you do some practices and studies where you draw over existing characters using a bit of the Loomis method to make your own notes and how to redraw these designs using somewhat of a version of a Loomis method. Because the Loomis method after all, is a tool to help you make your own language. Now let's talk about drawing and animating the human head. You can get very technical with how head anatomy works, but in most cases, it's really divided into two major parts. You have your cranium or the sphere of the head, and then you have the jaw. I had a teacher that used to work for Disney Animation, and one rule of thumb that he had was the sphere or the cranium of the head does not squash and stretch as much or as compared to the jaw, for example. It's really the jaw that does most of the squash and stretch for the head because it's the most expressive part, I mean expressive part, for things like animating lip sync and mouths opening and closing, stretching open, shutting tight, and when it's shut tight, the cheeks are also going to puff up or squash. The jaw is going to squash if the mouth is more closed or puckered and stretch open if the character is, let's say, yawning or screaming or gasping or saying something loud or have dramatic vowels. But again, that's just a very general rule of thumb. This will definitely change depending on the animation style. One of my former 2D animation teachers also talked about a quick shorthand for drawing heads. Of course, you can do everything by the books with the Loomis method, but there's also a way where you just draw a horizon line where it, the eye sits one third at the bottom of the sphere. This is where the eye will actually sit. This skips the step of having to draw the brow line half of the circle in the side view, Oh, and in the side view, the cranium is more stretched, so it's not really a sphere, it's more like a blimp. But remember, this also depends on the design since this was using Disney-style characters in mind, specifically the Glen Keane style of princesses. 
Now, as for the notes of a character having their mouth open, like, ah, there's this common mistake that the jaw must match the spacing of the open mouth verbatim. And if you do this exactly in the front view, what happens is that you get a puppet effect where it just feels like the jaw and chin are just sliding down. And the trick here is really to think about perspective and the mechanics of the jaw. If I were to draw this in a side profile or in a different angle where we can see more of the sides, notice how the jaw by the ear acts as a hinge. It's opening in an angle. If we were looking at this from the front view, parts of the chin will actually be hidden away because of perspective. The chin is tilting and facing downwards instead of facing forward. So when a mouth opens wide, the bottom of the mouth and the chin, the spacing narrows. Again, you want to practice your shorthand so you can draw the head in many and multiple angles. Use your cross-section lines to help you define the form and the perspective, depending on the angle. Especially for difficult angles where the head is looking extreme downwards or upwards at an extreme level, where you're drawing under the chin at that point. Another way to look at it too is that the head is really a construction of three different forms. A sphere for the cranium, a curved plane or a side of a cylinder for the face, and the cylinder for the neck. Combining these and deforming parts of them will help you get closer to the head. Being able to master the idea that these shapes are really just meshed together like clay and deformed can help you come up with a faster shorthand, especially if you've done this way multiple times. In these examples, I'm not drawing the sphere and then the cylinder or a plane. I'm thinking about these shapes in one uniform piece, like one general shape to represent the whole shape of the head. Kind of like a ball with a shield or a shell. I don't know how to describe it. If I feel like I'm dealing with something that's really difficult, like a difficult angle or something that I'm not really familiar with and I'm struggling, I'm frustrated, I would revert back to drawing each step one at a time. But for animation and storyboarding, I tend to keep things clear and readable, for a first pass at least. But hey, different priorities call for different shorthands. The priorities for animation and storyboarding is different from drawing for design. For design, you're really aiming for a specificity in the design, the shapes, the form. And if it's with multiple characters, the contrast and the diversity. When it comes to animation storyboarding, I'm not really drawing everything specific. Sometimes I'll do a really rough lollipop head with facial expressions. Because for me, the performance, the acting and the expressions are the main priority first. And once I have that done, then I can do a second pass where I start doing everything more detailed, more technical, more structurally, where I start defining the technical aspect, the constructional side of drawing on top of this very rough pass. Again, when I animate, I tend to draw things with a lollipop head with facial expressions on top of it. Very crude, very clear, nothing too detailed. I'm not too worried about keeping things on model at first. I'm maybe worried about the proportions, but not really about keeping things specifically and tight on model since I know that can be fixed on another pass on top of it. I'm also not super worried about the consistency of the shapes and making sure everything stays super solid. That's not really an issue for me yet. The priority is the idea and the performance. The next pass is where I start putting things more on model and adding more detail to the drawing, making it look like the character. This is where I would apply the constructional drawing, like the Loomis method, for example. And again, just remember, a good step of avoiding same face syndrome is to apply different variety to your head designs for your heads, the proportions, just keep changing it up. Even if you are using the same method for different heads, remember by just changing the size and shapes of certain parts of the head, it'll give you enough variety already. There is a lot to talk about when it comes to drawing the head for illustration or animation. It is best to study different types of techniques, what I would recommend you to do is to try and take your own existing designs or drawings, draw over them, draw over their heads, and apply the Loomis method on top of it, or something loosely inspired by it, or maybe something else, to see if it's something that benefits you. Because everyone has come up with their own language for drawing. Anyways, that's all. Bye. Interested in learning hand-drawn animation or learning how to finish an animated shot from beginning to end? Have a look at the store where you'll find the complete introduction to 2D animation video course, tutorials, and other resources. Learn classical animation approaches, drawing, lectures, techniques, and other process videos. Visit the store through the link in the description below.